we're going to jump right in. Welcome to introductions. This is week three. Um, some of you have been to all of them and, and you kind of know we're up to, but just real quick so you know our structure. It's a four week class or four week gathering. First week, we did an introduction to Christian theology, just basic, basic, really basic uh, stuff. Uh, last week, session two, we did an introduction to our liturgy, to our common worship. Tonight, we're going to talk about the history of Anglicanism, a little bit of grounding in the history of the denomination of which this church is a part. Next week is our last session. Next week, there's no slideshow from me. I have a few slides, but there's no long-winded presentation from the guy in the collar. Next week is all about doing a little bit of writing about ourselves. And if you'd like, and I hope that you'll want to do this, to share a short spiritual autobiography about yourself. So next week is when we kind of bring the work together and really focus more on ourselves and each other and going deeper with our own sort of spiritual histories. Um, so this is all in preparation for that. So hopefully this is a bit of a grounding in some theology, liturgy, and history. But again, mostly we're focused on having each of you really explore your own beliefs, your own modes of worship and spirituality, and your own spiritual history. Just as the other two nights tonight, we're going to do this presentation, hopefully be 45 minutes. Um, and then the remaining 45 minutes um, will be time to do a little bit of writing, answer a few questions. Again, not a quiz on the material, but questions about yourself. And then we'll break into groups to one-on-one on, -one. on Zoom, we'll probably just do a group of three, three of you can meet together um, and share your answers to the questions and talk more about the material and just sort of where your own thought process went. So without further ado, I'm trying to get rid of this. There we go. Tonight, we're talking about the history of Anglicanism. Now I wanna stop here and say, you might be asking what is Anglicanism? Because uh, the astute observer will note that we are called St. Augustine's Episcopal Church. Uh, Episcopal, though, just means the church that has bishops, which when you think about it, isn't a particularly helpful uh, term since most churches have bishops. But in the particular moment that this church was founded or refounded, uh, we were the main church in the U.S. that had bishops. So that's the term we use for ourselves. But the Episcopal Church is part of the worldwide Anglican Communion. Um, and the Anglican Communion are those churches that trace their history back to the Church of England as the sort of mother church or founding church. Um, Anglican being a sort of Latinized form of, of English. So uh, Anglican are those, those churches that aren't necessarily in England, but link themselves back to the Church of England. Um, now, our focus then tonight is actually going to be on figuring out what the Church of England is. Um, not so much, this is not actually history of the Episcopal Church, I, a little bait and switch. We're not talking about the Episcopal Church at all. We're not even going to make it to the century in which this church uh, was founded. Um, but I hope that by the end, you'll see why I made this choice. The questions that I do want to answer are what, it's, what is distinctive about our denomination? The, the Episcopal Church, but as you've already probably figured out, What's distinctive about us is pretty much what's also distinctive about the whole communion. So in answering these questions about the founding of the Church of England, I hope to be able to tell you at least two, I'm going to say there's two big distinctive things about the Episcopal Church. If you were to compare us to other denominations, Presbyterian, Methodist, Roman Catholic, uh, Greek Orthodox, uh, Evangelical churches, and you wanted to really understand what, what makes the Episcopal Church distinct, I hope to give you at least two pretty important answers. Not the only answers you could give, but two answers that I think are pretty significant. That's our goal. Without further ado, without further ado, we'll jump right in. So in order to talk about the setting of the Church of England, we need to go back even further to the sort of late stage of medieval Christianity. Now, some of you will know this history from your AP European history class or whatever in high school. For some of us, though, that's kind of itself in the distant past. Um, so just a quick refresher. Um, for many centuries, the Roman Catholic Church was the only sort of recognized legitimate Christian church in Western Europe, Western Europe, other parts of the world, different, different situation. Um, and of course, what that meant is that it was an extremely powerful institution, not only spiritually, uh, politically, but also economically. And indeed, there were parts of Europe, especially what is today Germany, where the local archbishop in addition to being the archbishop, the head of the church in that region, was also the prince of that principality. So the archbishop could literally also effectively be the president um, or the governor of your area. 
So, you know, imagine that, you know, the, the you know, Marion Buddy is also the mayor of DC. She's also the bishop and she's the mayor. So there's a lot of power concentrated in the church. Not surprisingly, this isn't something unique to the Roman Catholic Church, but whenever you have that much power concentrated in any human institution of whatever uh, religious uh, doctrine or without religious doctrine, you're likely going to have corruption, right, and abuse of that power. And indeed, by the late medieval period in Western Europe, there was quite a lot of corruption and um, a huge number of problems. If you study church history in the medieval period, you may be astounded at some of the scandals uh, that occurred. And so part of what this led to is a lot of people noticed this and they wanted to sort of draw some power away from the church, especially political leaders, some kings, princes, and other, other political elites, but also uh, economic elites. And this is a time, um, you know, late 15th, early 16th century. So that's late 1400s, early 1500s. Um, you may also remember is the time when we're also seeing the development of the Renaissance. And we're also seeing what we would call really, really early stages of capitalism developing. And so something like the middle class, we wouldn't call it that yet, is really forming. And people like bankers and lawyers are getting more and more influential and powerful. Um, but these people are not bishops and they are not aristocrats. So strictly speaking, they have close to zero formal political power. They don't like that the church has all this power. There is a lot of desire to pull some of this power away, especially secular authority, um, various people think, needs to be drawn out of the church. Um, and again, bishops often intervened in political and business decisions, which annoyed uh, political and business leaders, um, not a small amount, sometimes resulting in, in, in violence. So people wanted to draw power from the church, but as we said, the church was very powerful. It's hard to take powerful from an institution that's already very powerful. Right. Um, now, there was one issue in particular that would end up being very important to uh, the next few decades and, and the history uh, of Christianity in Western Europe in the 1500s, that is the 16th century. And that is the sale of indulgences. Now, the sale of indulgences by the Roman Catholic Church basically worked like this. Um, at this period of the church, um, when you were supposed to keep a very strict accounting of your sins, and you were supposed to go confess your sins weekly, maybe even more often than that, if you were particularly pious. And when you confessed your sins, you had to confess to a priest, couldn't just be some wise person who you thought could advise you. And that priest could then give you conditions on receiving absolution. So you wanted forgiveness for your sins, but the priest might say, well, before I can absolve you, you need to do X, Y, or Z. That could just be go say a bunch of prayers, um, but it could also be like you need to go apologize for what you did, offer restitution. It could be you need to go and do you know 20 hours of community service, essentially. Um, it could be you had to go and really do a lot of something in order to then receive absolution. And you know, we've got some, you've got some wealthy, busy people who don't have time for all this praying and, and, and do-goodery. And they think, wouldn't it be convenient if I could have a shortcut? And the Roman Catholic Church said, we might be able to arrange that. And so what an indulgence is, is instead of having to go through all that, you could confess your sins, but then buy an indulgence. A piece of paper that basically absolved you of a certain number and or a certain type of sin that you may have committed, right? And you could buy that document, and then essentially that was automatic absolution without having to go through any of the praying or do-gooding process. Um, and it turns out that these were relatively popular. The church really liked them because they were a great way to raise money, especially for construction projects. If I'm remembering correctly, um, I think it's St. Saint, Saint Peter, St. Saint Paul's Basilica in Rome was largely funded with the sale of indulgences. Um, the church didn't necessarily have a lot of money for these building projects. This was a great way to uh, to raise money. And for people who were at least somewhat pious, but also really busy and had some extra money lying around, this seemed like a great move. Now, there was a lot of abuse in this process. So the Pope did not himself go around selling these. He was also a busy guy. So essentially, large stacks of indulgences would be sold to people. They would then spread out through Europe and they would sell them locally. And whatever markup they could put on the indulgence, that was their cut. That was their profit. 
And so some of these people were quite enterprising and would mark them up quite a bit. And you could imagine, especially someone who was maybe particularly pious, very worried that they wouldn't be able to do all they needed to do to receive absolution, might be willing to spend a lot of money to try and access one of these. So they got very expensive. In some cases, people were really, you know, spending money they didn't have on these things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I imagine that many of you hearing this, and I doubt this is the very first time you heard about this. Again, a lot of European history classes in high school at least reference this for a moment. Um, and you remember that Martin Luther, this friar, uh, Augustinian friar named Martin Luther, uh, was highly offended at this. And I don't think it's hard to see why. I imagine that you all would share his conviction that there's there's something wrong with this whole uh, process, uh, right? Uh, and and Martin Luther was, he, he was concerned that some people were being impoverished by this. I mean, he saw this as unfair economically. But even more than that, he recognized that this obviously compromised any kind of genuine Christian spirituality. If you can, you know, do whatever you want, and there would, I think, be limits. Um, I'm not an expert on the technical legal details of indulgences, but I think that there were limits. You couldn't buy an indulgence for, you know, murdering 5,000 people. There, there were limits to this, but you could still get away with a lot of pretty um, terrible behavior. And he saw that if you could just buy your way out of this behavior, that the whole idea of, of Christian discipline, the whole idea of trying to actually live a renewed life, the whole idea of trying to actually turn away from selfishness to a life of love was pretty much cut off. You could just spend money and shortcut through that. And so Luther really needed to, he, he felt the church absolutely needed to end the sale uh, of indulgences. And uh, being a good Roman Catholic, he assumed the Pope had no idea about all these abuses. And so he wrote a letter to the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, commonly called the Pope, um, asking the Pope to basically end the sale of indulgences. If this, we need to cut this out, you're in your holiness. You don't know about all the terrible things that are going on, but this is really, really bad. It's terrible for Christian spirituality. Let's end it. And the, the short version is the Pope said no. The Pope was well aware of what was going on. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the various Popes thought about the details of this, but the flow of money proved to be too enticing, at least for a long time. Um, that they refused to end this. Now, indulgences have since been ended by the Roman Catholic Church, but uh, at this time, uh, the leadership was not willing to end the practice. Now, there's a whole lot of complex history that goes on over a few years as Luther struggles to figure out what to do. But tonight, we're not doing a class on Luther, so we're gonna move with, uh, with speed. Um, Luther basically, uh, beginning in 1517, he puts his famous 95 theses out on the door of a university. Um, and I don't know why the projector is doing that. That's, that's weird. It's like a, huh. It's not like that on my screen. I don't know why that black bar is there. But um, of, within a few years, by the 1520s, essentially Martin Luther has started an independent church that was not originally his intention. Um, but when the Roman Catholic hierarchy refused to end the sale of indulgences, they then also basically came and demanded that Luther recant his criticism of the church's sale of indulgences. Luther refused to do so. He's excommunicated, which means he can't receive communion. And rapidly, that's also going to mean that there could be warrants out for his arrest in various places. And uh, basically, Luther then starts an independent church, which we have come to call the Lutheran Church. I doubt Luther would have liked that that was the name of it. Uh, he was pretty into Jesus. I think he would have preferred a more Jesus-centered name. But um, the Lutheran Church comes from Luther, begins basically in southern Germany, what is today southern Germany, maybe northwest Austria, and spreads from there, primarily among German-speaking people, but not exclusively, eventually enters uh, Scandinavia as well. And of course, it's well known here in the U.S., mostly through influence of Scandinavian and German immigrants. Um, but Luther isn't only concerned about indulgences. The indulgences are sort of the manifestation of what he sees as a much deeper problem in Roman Catholic theology. So Luther isn't just trying to reform this one economic practice of the church. Luther really thinks they need a, a more thorough reformation of the church. And the baseline of his doctrine uh, is often summed up with his doctrine of salvation. You'll remember we talked about salvation the sort of theology of salvation two weeks ago, um, right? The way in which God can heal what is broken in the world. And Luther has some very particular ideas. And it's often summed up with the Latin phrases, sola gratia and sola fide, grace alone and faith alone. 
So Luther says, look, salvation uh, is received by grace alone, that is by God's action alone. A uh, human being can do nothing to earn salvation. But the thing that the human being is supposed to do in order to access this grace is to have faith, to put trust in uh, God and specifically to have faith in uh, Jesus Christ's ability to save us through our relationship uh, with him. So whereas the Roman Catholic Church might say, look, if you do good works, that sort of improves your relationship with God, Luther says, not really. Um, Luther does think you should do good things, but he just doesn't think that you can earn salvation by doing good things. Luther's argument is uh, salvation is offered as a pure grace. There's nothing you can do to earn it. Um, no human being really deserves it, but uh, in God's loving graciousness, God nevertheless decides to offer salvation. The thing that we need is not sort of piling up a lot of good works. Rather, it's this right sort of spiritual and mental attitude towards God. Now, there's a whole lot more to say about this. Um, and we could have a long debate about this. Some of you, uh, if you pay attention to my preaching, might find that I have I have some bones to pick uh, with, with Luther. Um, but uh, again, in terms of understanding the history, we're going to keep uh, we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, what Luther is criticizing in Roman Catholic theology again is not just the sale of indulgences, but also what he calls works righteousness. This idea that we can earn salvation through uh, through our works. I personally think that Luther is oversimplifying the problem, right? He's sort of saying it's either this or that, when really it's sort of both and. And it's worth pointing out that in the 1990s, the Worldwide Lutheran Association, the full name of which I forget, and the Roman Catholic Church basically had a bunch of meetings of theologians and ministers and basically said, yeah, we didn't actually disagree that much. Uh, we're all, we actually recognize the truth of what you're saying. But remember that there are political and economic issues at stake here too. The theology is significant, and we tend to remember that. But Luther's support, um, and he ends up getting quite a, a substantial amount of support, comes as much from political and economic leaders who simply want to reduce the power of the church. They're not necessarily agreeing with his theology. Many of them don't honestly care about his theology. They see in him a vessel for their own political and economic interests, right? And there's nothing new there that people choose their religious uh, doctrines on the basis of what's expedient for their own uh, power and wealth. Um, and to that end, uh, Luther also would eventually insist that uh, Christians need recognize no authority except scripture itself. So he would argue, look, the Pope and your local priest and your local bishop, they, are, they do not function as a final authority for you. Only uh, scripture uh, provides that uh, authority. And this is one of the reasons that Luther and others would insist that scriptures need to be translated into contemporary languages so people could actually read scripture. Because if you believe this, it's pretty important that you can read the Bible. Otherwise, how are you supposed to do that? Now, again, it's more complicated than this because what Luther really meant is the only authority is the interpretation of scripture that Luther himself preferred <laughs> um, because he had to get creative in uh, defending his position. For example, Luther detested um, the letter of James and he wanted to remove it from the Bible. He never actually did that because James says that faith without works is dead. That's a quote from James. So for Luther, that's a, it's a big problem to have that in the Bible. Um, so what Luther really means is his interpretation of scripture um, ought to be regarded as authoritative. As I said, Luther found many supporters, especially some of the princes of what is today Germany, the Holy Roman Empire um, at the time. Again, some of them probably genuinely really believed in this. I'm not questioning that, that no one thought that Luther was onto something theologically, but there's no question that many of those who supported him had other reasons for doing so. And here's Martin Luther. I think this, this is his pro professorial dress, not his Augustinian dress, I believe. I don't know of any order that allowed their members to wear hats. So I'm guessing this is his, when he was serving as a professor. All right. So what we ha now have, what Luther has helped to start, right, is what we call the Protestant Reformation because of Luther's protest against the Roman Catholic Church. And as is often the case, it's more complicated than that. There were previous attempts to achieve this the previous century, for example, um, the Moravian Church was founded. 
we don't always think of it as Protestant because it comes before Lutheranism, but it's actually involves many of the same concerns and criticisms. And there had been other efforts in the past to separate from the Roman Catholic Church. But Luther, with the exception of the Moravian Church, Luther's is the first that actually succeeds and isn't crushed within a few decades. So that's what we basically remember it. Um, and the Lutheran Church by the 1520s, 1530s is active in Germany. Um, and there will uh, soon be quite a long war, um, resulting, again, not only from religious differences, but often political economic differences masked as religious differences. This is Protestantism broadly conceived. And of course, Protestantism is much broader than just Lutheranism, but we kind of cite its beginning, again, with that exception of the Moravian Church, we cite its beginning here. Um, now, there are other leaders who will enter the fray and who will start their own movements, most notably John Calvin. So Luther, Luther was a German speaking. I think he was from Bavaria. I could have that wrong. So it was sort of Southern, Southeastern uh, Germany. John Calvin is originally from France. He's French speaking, but he moves to Switzerland after the French government tries to like arrest and kill him. Um, he's, he begins his activity in the 1530s, so about 20 years after Luther. And Calvin starts what's called uh, the Reformed Church. Sometimes we talk about Calvinism, but strictly speaking, he calls his movement the capital R Reformed Church. So here we have these terms Protestantism and Reformation um, kind of laid out for us. It's a protest against the Roman Catholic Church and the goal of reforming uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And again, I think originally Calvin was hoping not to start a new church, but to reform the church as it exists. It just turns out that most Roman Catholics don't go along with him, and so a separate church is instead established. Again, there's a whole lot more we could say about John Calvin. I had more originally. I cut it out because it's already too long. Um, Calvin shared a lot of Lutheran's con uh, Luther's concerns, but Calvin really goes further, and Calvin really wants to be much more systematic in presenting an entirely sort of new, he would say he's returning to the deep tradition. I would argue strongly with that, but that's neither here nor there. Um, He's, he's offering a, an entirely new or entirely renewed approach to Christianity, where every aspect of Christian life is really changed and transformed. It's not just about, say, the doctrine of salvation, but the way we worship, the leadership structure, everything uh, ought to change. Luther is offering a somewhat more piecemeal change, changing some major elements, but keeping a lot in place. Luther kept the bishops. Luther actually kept a lot of the aspects, the, the uh, yeah. aspects of, uh, of worship. Um, Calvin really provides a complete change uh, across the board. So you probably know Calvin best for his doctrine of predestination, this doctrine that uh, everything that is that will ever happen has been predetermined by God from the beginning of time, including what you will do. This is sort of taking Luther's rejection of works righteousness to its absolute extreme. For Calvin, there are no human works, really. God decided what you're going to do. And that also means God has already decided whether you're saved or not. You have actually no control over it, um, which raises a host of questions, which I may we'll discuss in a different class. Um, I've, I've addressed these before. Some of you uh, know my, my view of this, uh, take a rather dim view of it, but uh, it's very influential and will be very influential in the Church of England. So it's important for us to at least have this uh, in our mind. He also wanted to simplify worship, get rid of all the complex rituals, no candles, no icons, no stained glass. None of that, very simple, austere worship to avoid even the possible hint of any kind of idolatry. He also wanted a new model of leadership. He wanted to move from an Episcopal model, bishop having model, to a Presbyterian model. Presbyter being the Greek word for elder, it's often used to refer to my, my job, the priest or the minister. Um, so a different mode of, of leadership. But again, for the sake of trying to be done in a uh, relatively quick time frame. We're going to keep moving. Again, if you have questions or you want to learn more about any of this, please feel free to talk to me after tonight or email me. I'll be happy to talk more about any of these things. I'll be more happy to talk about some things than others, but nevertheless, I'll be happy to talk about these things. There, oh, there's John Calvin with his cool hat and his long beard. There you go. All right. Finally, we get to England. I said we're talking about the Church of England. I spent the last 15 minutes talking about Switzerland and Germany. Uh, at this time, the king of England is Henry VIII, right? And some of you, again, you know a little bit of this history, right? 
Uh, now, in the 15 teens, 1520s, Henry is actually quite loyal to the Roman Catholic Church. He's even titled a defender of the faith because he writes a tract or he gets a tract ghost written for him. It's not clear. Um, attacking Luther's uh, theology. Um, but although Henry is loyal to the Roman Catholic Church and largely uninterested in Protestant thought, there are plenty of people in England, including not a small number of theologians and even some priests, and certainly some uh, political leaders and especially economic leaders who really do want to see England get independence from the Roman Church. This was a long-standing desire in England, going back at least three centuries. This was not a new concern. Uh, and again, I originally I had slides discussing that, but it, it was way too long. So I'm going to skip over it for now, but just leave it to be said that for centuries, um, many English people had resented the power of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in England for a variety of reasons. So the king is loyal, but beneath that loyalty, underneath him, even relatively high up um, in the hierarchies of English life, there is concern, there is resistance. And here's the thing. Um, Henry had a, a personal problem which had political implications, right? Um, as he was getting older, he had no male heir, um, which is a big deal. Because if Henry dies on the throne at this point in time, it's not entirely clear who, will, who would take power. Um, up until this point, as far as I'm aware, um, no woman had ever uh, come to the throne of England. That will change soon, as you will see. But there was no provision in English law that allowed um, a woman to come to the throne. Henry had a daughter, but not a son, and he was concerned at his death what would happen. What was likely to happen would be a bunch of male people in his family, nephews, cousins, would all claim the throne, and there'd be a big civil war. It had happened uh, before, and he really wanted to avoid that for a variety of reasons. Um, but one of the things that kings at this time wanted is they wanted to be remembered gloriously and fondly. And if you die and the very next thing that happens is there's a huge civil war, you're not remembered. No matter what you achieved in your reign, you're not remembered well. Um, and you'll be remembered as a man who couldn't do sort of his most essential duty as a king, which is to have a son. So he's very nervous about this. He's personally invested. He's politically invested. And he decides that the problem, it must be his wife. Like she's not able to conceive a male heir. And, and by the 1520s, they're both getting older. And so the, the reality is that there are physical uh, limitations for each of them uh, in conceiving children. And what Henry wants to have happen is he wants the Pope to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Notice annul, not divorce, right? Because the Roman Catholic Church does not allow divorce. There's no divorcing in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but you can annul a marriage. You might be asking, well, what's the difference? Uh, well, divorce is when a marriage is recognized as legitimate, but then one or both parties decide to end that marriage. Um, that is simply not allowed in the Roman Catholic Church. But an annulment is when you uh, argue that a marriage was never legitimate, that it was illegally performed, um, or that those two people were not eligible to be married. So for example, if two people get married and they didn't realize it, but they were first cousins, and they discover it five years later, the marriage ought to be annulled because those people are not permitted to be married um, under most, under most uh, law systems in the world today. Um, or if it turns out that one of the parties coerced the other into getting married. That is not acceptable. The marriage could be annulled because it was illegitimate from the start. Henry has a complicated argument um, for the details of why his marriage should be annulled. It has to do with the fact that his um, wife had been engaged to his brother who then died. Um, or they may actually have been married. I can't remember if they actually got married or whether they were just engaged. But it doesn't actually matter. Henry was coming up with a reason why the marriage should be annulled to give himself um, ecclesial, church, and political cover for kind of getting rid of uh, this inconvenient woman. Now, this annulling of the marriage of a, of a king who wants one is something that the Catholic Church often would do, right? Because powerful people look out for other powerful people. Oftentimes, the Pope would be like, yeah, sure, whatever. I'll annul your marriage. No problem. You know, send, send a donation uh, to help me build some more buildings in Rome, and it'll be totally cool. But there was a problem. Um, Catherine of Aragon was the daughter of the King of Spain at the time. And the King of Spain had occupied Rome with Spanish troops. And the King of Spain really did not want this marriage annulled. 
because by having his daughter as the queen consort in England, he had a lot of influence in England. And indeed, he was hoping that in the event that Henry died without a male heir, perhaps he could get a Spanish guy on uh, the English throne. That wasn't entirely out of the realm of possibility. It was a long shot, but possible. And, you know, Spain had long wanted to assert control over England, as we would see with the famous attack of the Armada in 1588, still to come. At this point in time, England is really a second tier power and Spain is a top tier power. So Spain here is trying to sort of exert almost a kind of, it's not quite colonial, but that kind of influence over a smaller power. Uh, in our era, those relationships have been reversed, but um, at this time, that, that's what's going on here. And so the king was clear to the Pope, you're not gonna do this annulment or something bad might happen to you and your people in Rome. And the Pope was like, okie dokie, no annulment for you, Henry. Sorry, deal with it. Here's Henry, right? Looking very, I don't know how to describe his outfit, to be honest with you, but very flashy. It's worth noting that he's got the tights on and he's made sure the painter has really shown the definition of his calves. And it's really interesting because you, you actually, you notice this with a lot of paintings from this time. Uh, Louis XIV actually has a lot of paintings where he's actually turned back this to show off his calves. And we think of putting on tights to show off your legs as, and our culture is associated with femininity. At this time, all the biggest, baddest kings wore tights to show off their calves because that was actually a sign of virility and maleness. So again, a reminder that a lot of these fashion trends are just very arbitrary and, and change. Anyway, he's showing off his wealth. He's showing off his physical prowess, um, all his symbols of his reign here, looking very fancy. All right. So we are rapidly moving towards the Independent Church of England. Uh, so Henry is running out of options. The late 1520s, the early 1530s, he's getting older. I think at this point he's entering it, certainly his late 30s or early 40s. Um, he really needs to get this annulment. Now, at this time, he had some of these people in England, church leaders and others, who liked the Reformation. They were saying, well, look, King, you know, if you announced yourself independent from Rome, we could get you that annulment tomorrow because you would become the head of the church. The, the secular leader would become the head of the church. You can make sure the Archbishop of Canterbury, who would be the top sort of ecclesial leader in England, you can make sure that person is you know, amenable to your interest. We can get you the annulment. No problem. So maybe you should really think about reforming the English church. Remember, Henry wasn't interested in this from a theological or cultural perspective, but he began to be very interested in this possibility for his own personal and political reasons. Uh, and indeed, in 1533, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cramer, who had been approved by the Pope, um, announced the annulment of Henry and Catherine, Catherine's marriage. And basically, there was a back and forth. The Pope basically said, whoa, 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 no, 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 undo this. You need to announce that the annulment is itself annulled. This is wrong. Cranmer and Henry refused to. The Pope excommunicates them. And so by 1534, they announced an independent Church of England with Cranmer as basically the leading archbishop. Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, but with Henry as the actual head of the church officially. And it's worth pointing out that today, Charles III, right? That's how he styled the new king of England, Charles III. He's the head of the Church of England, strictly speaking, right? So we now have the Church of England. But again, Henry was not actually interested in the Reformation. And so very little actually changed between 1534 and Henry's death in 1547. So it's 13, 13 years. Um, not a lot changes. Um, for the most part, the liturgy stays the same. The practices stay the same. The one big change we do see is um, the service, I, I think even very early on, is offered in English or soon will be. And English translations of the Bible are to be provided in every parish. So that in theory, if you're literate, which you probably aren't, but if you're literate, you can go to the local parish church, you know, on your day off, and you can read scripture for yourself. Um, and even though it only impacted a small number of people directly, it was still a radical move. And it's worth pointing out that you hopefully had one literate friend, and you would all go together, and they would read it out loud to you so you could listen. This is new. For centuries, uh, the English peasantry had no way of accessing scripture outside of the priest's sermon because the scripture was provided in Latin only. <clears throat> All right. 
But, you know, Henry, like all of us, is, is mortal. He dies in 1547. He has three surviving children. He does have a male heir. So all of this, as far as Henry is concerned, was worth it. Now, I'm skipping over a huge amount of drama and violence. Um, Henry ends up marrying a number of women. He ends up executing a lot of those women in order to get rid of them so he can marry yet more women. Um, it's really sort of like a soap opera on steroids. Um, but again, not our focus tonight. We're going to sure to keep moving. But I just want to note that there's a whole lot of interesting history in those 13 years. Um, if you're into that kind of thing, look it up. I think there's even like a Netflix dramatization of it. Can't speak to the quality, but certainly um, a, lot of, a lot of drama to be enjoyed there. Now, he does have a son. It's, uh, his son is born, uh, Edward, uh, to his third wife, Jane Seymour, not his second wife, Anne Boleyn. And so as the only son, Edward comes to the throne, even though he's the youngest of Henry's three children. Uh, Edward is styled Edward VI. And the main thing about him is that, unfortunately, he does not live or reign very long. He assumes the throne around the age of 10, very young, and he dies at 16 without any children. So the problem that Henry wanted to avoid, he only kicks down the road uh, for a few years, essentially. Now, Edward was very pro-Reformation. And he might have, it's, it, all indications are, I think, that he was genuinely really zealous for Calvin's uh, thought. And uh, not surprisingly, because he was essentially trained by a bunch of Calvinist uh, teachers from, from day one. But it's also worth pointing out that he had um, really good personal motivations for being pro-Reformation, pro-Protestant, right? Because the Roman Catholic Church viewed Edward as an illegitimate heir, right? He, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, considered that in 1547, when Henry died, Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, was still his wife. According to Roman Catholics, she was his only wife. So any child born with another woman would be seen as born out of wedlock. And you can't become the king of anything if you were born out of wedlock. So if Edward were to accept Roman Catholic authority, he would undermine his own ability to rule. So again, I'm not saying he didn't have real conviction. But there's no question that his political and personal motivations also meant he was going to be pro-Reformation. Um, but indeed, he did he did pursue a radical attempt to reform uh, the English church, really wanting to go from a, a Church of England that was independent, but still basically operated in a way very similar to the Roman Catholic Church, which is what Henry had. Some real changes. He, uh, Edward really wanted to push the idea of really trying to create a church modeled on what Calvin really wanted, a complete reformation of the church. Now, this took many forms, which we're not going to cover because, again, uh, as always, we need to move quickly. But here's Edward. As you can see, he's still quite young. He's holding a Bible, right? Showing, showing his piety, to be sure. One of the most uh, important contributions during Edward's reign is this is when you have the first edition of the Book of Common Prayer, 1549, pretty much just written flat out by Thomas Cranmer, not entirely on his own, but pretty much. Cranmer really writes um, and organizes the Book of Common Prayer in 1549. There's a new edition very quickly. They want an even more reformed edition in 1552. So this is a very reformed, very Calvinist uh, document. But um, the Book of Common Prayer, right, provides common liturgies in English. And this is a, a radical idea at the time. That you've got one book, and all of the liturgies that you use for public worship are there. And they're in what is then regular everyday English. You know, the English of this time now sounds very kind of elevated and stilted to us. But that's just how people spoke 500 years ago. Um, that was a new thing, right? For a thousand years, the liturgy had only been available in, in Latin. And here it is where any literate person can read it and a group of other people can, can gather around, listen, and join in worship um, together. Um, but in addition to providing liturgies, it did also provide catechisms and something called the 39 Articles, which did also attempt to kind of indoctrinate a very reformed um, understanding of Christian thought. Those 39 Articles are still included, for example, in our Book of Common Prayer uh, here in the U.S. even. So the Book of Common Prayer, this title becomes common um, in every Anglican church. So every church that sort of derives its history to the Church of England will basically put together its own Book of Common Prayer in whatever language or languages are used in that country. So, for example, in the U.S., um, we have our most recently approved version um, was approved in 1979, but it draws its heritage back to these first books and, and, and indeed 
uh, many of the collects, we talked about collects last week, uh, many of them are actually basically just updated versions of Cranmer's uh, collects. So this is really a seminal uh, work uh, and an important work. And I began by saying I wanted to identify maybe two really distinctive features of what it means to be Episcopalian. This is one of them. The Book of Common Prayer is really a, this essential idea. The way that that is played out in the Episcopal Church, to jump ahead a few hundred years, is the Episcopal Church does not insist on uh, everyone agreeing to the same doctrines. For example, some Episcopalians might really, really agree with John Calvin. They might be totally into predestination. Other Episcopalians might adopt a view much closer to the Catholic Church's view on things um, and, and everything in between. And basically we say, cool, that's great. The only creed we have are the Nicene Creed and the Apostle Creed, creeds that go back to the fourth century and earlier. There's no updated version of a creed that you have to sign on to to be Episcopalian. This is different. Most Lutherans have to, have to sign a specific confession. Uh, likewise, I think most Presbyterians are expected to sign a particular confession where they basically are signing on to specific theological agendas. We don't do that. Instead of trying to be unified around our theology, hopefully we share some foundational uh, aspects of our theology, kind of the basics of Christian thought. But instead of trying to find unity in theology, we find unity in our liturgy. We say we can disagree about kind of what's under the hood theologically, but let's worship in the same way so that we can gather together and worship. And let's find a common mode of worship that we can actually kind of unify ourselves around. So the Book of Common Prayer provides that, and it's really one of the distinctive features of, a, of the Episcopal Church in the broader Anglican communion. Again, we could do a whole series just on uh, the BCP, um, but uh, just for now, I just want to sort of, um, you know, mark, mark this. This is one of those distinctive features, right? Bound together by common liturgy. You can go to two churches that have, might have major political and theological disagreements, and yet the words of their worship will be remarkably similar. There could be differences, but there will be a lot of similarities. That liturgy that we covered last week you'll see that same structure at just about every Episcopal church, and not just in the Episcopal church, around the world. When I lived in South Korea, there was one Anglican church in the town that I lived in. Actually, I say town, it was a city, um, about 200,000 people, um, Anglican church, small Anglican church, and I went there, and the service was in Korean, of course, because one of the bedrock rules of the uh, Anglican communion is worship must be in the common language of the people who live wherever you are. And so I would go to church, and I do not speak Korean, but I could quickly figure out what part of the service we were in. And I would recite it in English while people were reciting it in Korean. And there was something really powerful about that, that I could worship with them, even though I couldn't speak their language, because we had this kind of unified liturgy. Even though the Anglican uh, Church of Korea and the Episcopal Church of the US are completely autonomous, we have no power over them and vice versa. Each member church of the Anglican communion is autonomous. Uh, nevertheless, this feature of maintaining the Book of Common Prayer and that common worship uh, remains. All right, moving on. Now here's Thomas Cranmer, who's the guy who pretty much put together the Book of Common Prayer. He's also one of the leaders in uh, suggesting to Henry that he get the annulment uh, from Catherine. First Archbishop of Canterbury under a uh, independent Church of England. Now, as I said, Edward um, died at the age of 16, and this meant that the, um, the succession crisis that Henry had tried so hard to avoid finally came to pass. And what eventually happened, there was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of debate and discussion, certainly in Parliament, um, but rather controversially, ultimately, his eldest half-sister, Mary, comes to the throne. And as far as I'm aware, English history buffs can correct me, I believe this is the first time um, that a woman has actually come to the throne and become the sovereign. Of course, there have been queens before who were the queen consort of a, of a male king. I believe this is the first time in English history um, that this had occurred. She is titled Mary I. And uh, here's the thing. She was, Mary, she was Henry's original child, born to uh, Catherine, um, to his first wife, right? And it's worth pointing out that had, to the extent that Henry annulled his marriage, many people might regard Mary as effectively illegitimate, right? Because annulment basically means that Henry's uh, marriage to Catherine never happened. 
So Mary was not a fan of the independent church of England. She was not a fan of her father's behavior. She was very pro Roman Catholic. And she wanted to basically uh, revert the Church of England back to Roman Catholic authority. That could take a number of different paths, but that was her goal. Um, and again, every reason to believe she had this real conviction. There's every reason to think Mary genu genuinely believed that this new church was heretical and bad and that it was misleading people spiritually. But she also had a deep personal investment in this, right? Um, because this move away from the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church um, had, again, questioned her legitimacy as an heir and had been deeply offensive to her mother. Uh, and she was not pleased with that whatsoever. So she attempts to return uh, the Church of England to Roman Catholic control. Again, this involves a huge amount of history, which we're just going to fly over, not because it's not important or interesting, but in the attempt to stay somewhat on time. Oh, my gosh. Um, and if you, uh, you know, she's best remembered, especially by uh, Protestants as, as Bloody Mary. I mean, she did execute uh, quite a large number of her opponents. Um, and this included uh, Thomas Kramer, who we just saw a moment ago. Um, he um, famously um, sort of recanted his pro-Reformation position uh, while he was in jail. Then he recanted his recantation. And according to tradition, he, uh, when he was burned at the stake, he, he took his right hand and, and Put it down into the fire first to sort of punish his hand for writing that he had not believed in the Reformation at some point. So this very, you know, this this very uh, dramatic moment, um, and certainly uh, these executions motivated pro pro Reformation forces in the English Church to get really serious. Plenty of people fled England, especially fled to the Low Countries, uh, what is today Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, they would come back after Mary's death, but. Speaking of Mary's death, in 1558, um, she dies. So she's on the throne. Quick math here, I think five years. She uh, assumes the throne. She's already relatively old, especially for that time. She has no children. And so again, the succession crisis that Henry tried to avoid, we're back at it again. Now here's Mary. I think this painter really captures a sternness in this You Really, you're like, this, this person could be Bloody Mary. I mean, she really looks like she is about to like punch you in the face here. She is not pleased. Um, so there's, there's Mary the first. Now, after Mary's death, um, the decision is that Henry's last child, uh, Elizabeth, will take uh, the throne, uh, Mary and Edward's half-sister. Elizabeth was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, Henry's second wife. So she's younger than, younger than Mary, older than Edward. Elizabeth comes to the throne. And again, we continue the innovation, not just one female ruler, but now two in a row. But this is seen as better than the other option, which would be to open the field to any number of male candidates. Again, could likely lead not only to civil war, but to foreign invasion, especially from potentially Spanish folks who think they have a decent claim on the throne. Um, and who would probably get not a small amount of funding and backing from the Vatican uh, to do so. Now, Elizabeth, like Edward, is not going to be interested in the Roman Catholic Church controlling the Church of England because the Roman Catholic Church sees Elizabeth as illegitimate. Um, her mother is Anne Boleyn. According to the Roman Catholic Church, Anne Boleyn was never married to Henry, so she would not be regarded as a legitimate heir and therefore not a legitimate ruler, excuse me. So she is not gonna be in favor of Roman Catholic return to power. But Elizabeth does not seem to have been particularly um, uh, devout, not to say that she was necessarily irreligious, but she was not ideological in her approach to religious doctrine. And indeed, Elizabeth, uh, I would need to say, was exceedingly smart and perceptive as a ruler. And what she mostly noticed was that, especially since the death of her father, England had just been racked by division and violence for, for the better part of a decade, over a decade, actually, at this point. Um, and she recognized the danger. She recognized that uh, Spain would be more than happy to invade um, to invade England, to occupy England, to take control of England, that there would be others who would be in favor of this, that England's longtime enemy, France, would also be very happy to see the Church of England destroyed and England uh, conquered uh, by foreigners. She also knew there was not a small number of aristocratic forces in England, especially in the north of England, 
who would also like to use a return of the Roman Catholic Church to draw power away from the English throne uh, in London. So she recognized the threats all around her. And what she needed was a way to find unity. And instead of swinging towards a very pro-reformed or, or to a very pro-Roman Catholic position, she needed to find a way to make both sides happy enough, right? She needed stability. And what that really means is Elizabeth, and here she is, looking very regal. I think of all the monarchs so far, I think she's the most bedecked in like jewels and lace. And Henry competes with her, right? But uh, she she comes, I mean, she's really showing the, the power, the growing power of the throne. The ships there in the background are also, a, you know, great indicator of sort of England knowing where its power and its wealth, even then, uh, uh, lies. Uh, what Elizabeth needs is a compromise. She needs a way to compromise between the pro-Reformation and the pro-Roman Catholic uh, forces. And what she recognized, and others too, um, is that the two sides... Um, tended to focus on dis different aspects of religion. Both sides cared about all these aspects, but they tended to emphasize different aspects, okay? Um, the reform-minded people tended to be concerned mostly with doctrine. How do you achieve salvation? Is predestination true? Um, in what way is Jesus's uh, life or death or resurrection? Um, in what way are these things salvific? And at this time, they're mostly focused on the way the cross is salvific another topic for another time to think more about. But um, they had deep, long debates into the night about these subjects, and they cared very deeply that the correct view was arrived at, written down, and taught to everyone. Um, the Roman Catholics and sort of um, those who sympathize more with the Roman Catholic perspective in England cared about doctrine, but they cared more about liturgy and practice. This is especially true for many of the peasants living in the countryside who tended to be anti-Reformation, not because they had like read Calvin and thought that he was wrong because they weren't reading anything for the most part, but you know, they, their great, 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 great granddad and grandma had come to this church and they had worshiped in this way and they had candles on the altar and they had icons on the walls and they had a big rood screen, this big metal framework between the people and the altar. And they were annoyed that all these things had been taken away for them for reasons that they may not quite have understood and almost certainly just didn't care about. They wanted a return to the traditional mode of worship. That's what they really cared about. What does church look like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like, right? Under Calvin, it smelled like nothing. Under the Catholic church, it could have all kinds of rich uh, odors in the incense, right? Elizabeth recognized this. Now, the two sides are focusing on different aspects. What if I kind of give the reformers most of what they want in doctrine, and I give the Catholics most of what they want in worship? Hmm. And this is a very simplistic version, obviously. It wasn't quite that simple, um, but for our purposes here tonight, um, I'm gonna keep it as simple as that. This is the Elizabethan Compromise. Uh, a church that is essentially reformed in doctrine, what that means will continue to be explored and um, to get technical, the eventual version of reformed thought that people, that will be accepted in the Church of England in the next century is called Arminian Reformed Doctrine rather than Calvinist. Arminian, not Armenian, Arminian. Arminius was a Dutch thinker who kind of took Calvin's thought but made it less radical. He kind of saw, he kind of sanded off the hard edges of Calvinism, of which there are many. So he had a lot of sanding to do. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, essentially, um, the, the Church of England would approve of more or less capital R reform doctrine, but the mode of worship would look very Catholic. You can have candles can have vestments. Maybe you can even have some icons. You could probably get some incense. Um, the worship is going to look like it used to look before the Reformation ever occurred. Whereas in Calvin's church, worship had become very austere, very simple, no images, no stained glass, no candles, um, a, a generally a lower view of the sacraments. Not, not a non-sacramental view for Calvin, but a lower view um, one of the things that people would do at this time, for example, if you were a very reformed person, you would make a point of as you came into the church, you would take off your hat and coat and lay it on the altar as a way of saying, this is just a table. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't have this elevated view of any of the, the sacred space. For a very Catholic-minded person, right, this is a, this is a very sacrilegious act. Um, so Calvin wants this a very stripped down version of worship. 
Elizabeth says, look, we're going to maintain uh, more or less. It's still going to, we're going to change a few things. It's going to be in English, for example. We're not going to go all the way back to the traditions, but we're going to maintain a lot of it, especially a lot of the visible and the physical things that are really important to 80 to 90% of the population. And again, it's not to say that both sides only cared about either doctrine or liturgy, but that they emphasized these different aspects. And this allowed Elizabeth to get this compromise, and it worked for quite a while. Um, there would be eventually a civil war in England, but that would be decades after Elizabeth's uh, death, and really caused by very, very different issues for the most part. Religion entered the equation, but it wasn't the driving issue. Now, the Elizabethan compromise over time needs a more vaunted name. No one likes a compromise, so we can't call it that, and we've come to call it the Via Media. For some reason, despite our whole thing about like not using Latin, we decided to put it in Latin. I don't really know why. Um, but it's just Latin for the middle path, or the middle way. Uh, and the Via Media um, basically says that the Anglican Communion, the Church of England in the Anglican Communion, is a middle path between the Reformed and Protestant world and the Catholic world. We often write Catholic with a small c. We don't mean just the Roman Catholic Church, but the, the broader set of Catholic traditions. Instead of being reformed all the way or really kind of going back to an old school Catholic view, let's take a middle course. And what this has come to mean is we can actually draw relatively freely from either side to find out where we want to be. And as time has gone by, the church might veer more towards one side or the other. Um, in the 15th, excuse me, in the 16th and 17th century, the doctrine was pretty reformed. By the 19th century, it was something called the Oxford Movement. It came into a more Catholic view. In the 20th and 21st century, I would say by and large, um, Catholic, small c Catholic thought has been predominant um, in, in the church. Not exclusively so, but there's been a movement to appreciate a lot of um, what was left behind. The, our current prayer book, the 79 prayer book, the whole idea of even doing Eucharist communion every Sunday a hundred years ago, that was seen as a very Catholic thing. You know, you would never do that as an Episcopalian. Uh, but now that's that's become really the norm. So this just shows that we have the space to kind of navigate between these traditions and to try to draw what's best from each and to perhaps try to leave behind what's, what's not so great about each. Um, I said earlier that the Book of Common Prayer was one of those touchstones that really defined our denomination. If you want to know what's distinctive about the Episcopal Church, the Book of Common Prayer has to be up there. The Via Media, though, is really the big one. If you were going to just say one thing, what's the Episcopal Church? What defines you? Via media. We are Reformed and Catholic. Uh, we somehow attempt to be both. We're in this path uh, in between them. Now, as with any compromise, uh, when Elizabeth announced this, neither side was completely happy. But it was good enough to avoid a civil war. It was good enough to begin to build a genuinely new culture within the Church of England. Um, and in time, it would form into this um, what we call the Via Media. Uh, William Laud in particular in the 17th century um, would lay out a theological text that really tried to argue for the Via Media, not only as sort of politically expedient for uh, his sovereign, but actually as a good approach. And in time, it's really being, being the thing that, that sort of defines uh, the church. A middle path, reformed and Catholic at the same time. And this general attitude, um, I think, still pervades the church. I would say my own experience, for example, is I, I was not raised in the Episcopal Church. Um, and I often jokingly say, half joking, it's partially serious, is that I became uh, Episcopalian because it's as Catholic as I could be without actually being Catholic, right? Um, I can't necessarily sign on to all the theological or social or political views of the Roman Catholic Church. But I was really seeking a more sacramental understanding of theology. I really liked the idea of engaging more intentionally in ritual. Um, so I was attracted to the sort of small the Catholicism uh, of the Episcopal Church. But at the same time, intellectually, doctrinally, I wanted open space um, for my own views. And uh, for me, the Episcopal Church is this interesting place where politically, socially, um, we tend to be pretty progressive, but you come to church and our liturgy is very traditional, right? Could be fourth century Greece, except for the language. Everything else about it is very traditional. So we've married a very modern progressive set of things with a very traditional set. Uh, most churches tend to kind of 
everything is going to be kind of new looking or everything is going to be very kind of old looking. We kind of blend these. And for me, this is really what drew me to the church. And, and what kept me here is that ability to, to stay in that, in that middle path. So the Book of Common Prayer, the Via Media, these would be the two things I think that really have defined the Anglican communion. And even though we didn't talk at all about the United States or the Episcopal Church, um, these two things we have inherited uh, from the Church of England, and I think are still um, have, a, have a big impact on our community, our mode of worship, the way we think, the way we talk to each other, um, et cetera. So there we go. I know we got started a little bit late, so we're ending a little bit late. Um, but um, my hope is that thinking about the Via Media as you continue to be at St. Augustine's over the coming weeks and months, you may begin to notice things. You might say, ah, now I understand kind of what we're doing here. Uh, having this lens of the Via Media might help to understand some of the distinctive things that, that we do here. All right, all that said, we now have our, our questions. Now, if you're here in person, I have clipboards with the questions, so you don't need to write this down. Um, I'll put them on the screen, though, if you're with us on Zoom. Again, just like last time, we have four questions. But uh, again, these are not questions. Uh, I'm not asking you a quiz about what I just, uh, all the information I threw at you. These are all questions to help you go deeper, um, a little bit in responding to the history of the material, but especially thinking about your own spiritual history, your own views of these things. 